Uh, just to let everyone know, uh, these webinars are for educational purposes only. And uh, we have a zero tolerance policy when it comes to solicitation. Uh, so therefore, if we see that throughout any communication, we have a zero tolerance policy, so you will be removed. But these webinars are for educational purposes only, and it's our goal to educate small business and enterprise to be able to coincide and work with the federal market. So uh, let's start with a video. A video, uh, if you want to give a quick introduction. Yes, good morning, everybody. Welcome to our webinar series. Uh, my name is Ovidio Santiago. I'm the Director of Engagement and Small Business Development. Awesome, awesome. And you have a, a great background and you're looking good at video. So it's good to see you, sir. And for all those that uh, get emails from a video, now you have a direct face to who you're actually speaking to. And then uh, let me go to Maria. Maria? Everyone, I'm Maria Belmont, a director in business development. And thank you all for being here today. Awesome, Maria. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, let's go to Dana. Good afternoon, it's Dana Viles, um, and I am the Director of Marketing, and I'm excited for this uh, this week's webinar. Thank you for being here. Perfect, perfect. And then we have, let's go to uh, Mike. Hey, everybody, Mike Delportier, Federal Market Strategist, and uh, looking forward to today's webinar. Thanks for being here. Beautiful, beautiful. Alex? Hello, everyone. I'm Alex, Director of Media, and I'm excited to be here today. Awesome, awesome. And then uh, let's go to Zach. Hey, everyone. Zach Larson, co-founder of Federal Contracting Advisors and today's solo presenter, and I'm really looking forward to today's topic. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you, uh, Zach. And uh, so far, we're at 83 attendees, which is perfect. And as mentioned earlier on this webinar, everyone, we're trying out a new feature with Zoom because uh, Zoom is always adapting and creating new engagement uh, protocols. So if anybody wants to communicate and they have questions with regards to this particular session, on the bottom of your Zoom, you should be able to see a uh, an icon that says Q&A. Feel free to just type your questions and we'll be able to answer them throughout the uh, Q&A sessions of this particular webinar. So with that being said, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's insightful webinar. I'm Hugo VLS, United States Marine Corps veteran and principal of Federal Contracting Advisors. It is my absolute pleasure to be your host for this session. We are thrilled to see so many of you joining us, and we hope you're as excited as we are to dive into the intricacies of the federal government's acquisition process. Today, we have the privilege of being joined by a very special guest, Zach Larson, co-founder of Federal Contracting Advisors. Zach is not just an expert in federal contracting and procurement. He's a veritable treasure trove of knowledge and experience in the field. His insights today are said to transform the complex maze of federal acquisitions into a navigatable and understandable path. As we've come to realize, navigating the federal government's procurement process can often feel like unraveling a Gordian knot, but that's precisely the challenge we aim to address in today's session. We're going to explore the generic basic federal acquisition flowchart, a vital tool that simplifies this process clear and actionable steps. This session is designed to be a game changer, offering crucial understanding, not only for those directly involved in federal contracting, but also for anyone connected to this expansive industry. Whether you're a small business owner, a consultant, or a decision maker in your organization, having a grasp of federal acquisition processes can unlock tremendous opportunities and provide you with a significant competitive advantage. We want this webinar to be as interactive and enriching as possible. So we encourage you all to participate actively to the Q&A, ask questions, to share your experiences. Your input is what makes these webinars so valuable and engaging. But before we transition, we're going to play a short video that will introduce our platform to those that are new to the webinar series.
Introducing Federal Contracting Advisors, navigating you to success in federal contracting. In the intricate landscape of federal contracting, the complexities are many, but so are the opportunities. Success is not just about breaking through the maze, it's about mastering it. This is where Federal Contracting Advisors enters the picture. We are not just an advisory firm. We are a comprehensive support mechanism engineered to propel you through the federal contracting universe. Federal Contracting Advisors is your strategic advantage in a challenging but rewarding arena. With us, you gain access to unparalleled expertise, personalized strategies, and forward-looking insights. If you're truly invested in mastering the federal contracting sphere, then your search for the ideal partner ends here. Partnering with federal contracting advisors is not just a decision. It's a vow for sustainable success. Okay, perfect. And now, without further ado, let's give a warm welcome to Zach Larson. Zach, we're all looking forward to the insights you're going to share with us today, diving into the federal acquisition process. Zach, take it away. Thank you, Hugo. Glad everybody is here for the new year. Uh, I'm going to jump right in and share my screen because this is a very important topic and a very important subject for anybody in the federal contracting space. So can give me a show of hands on my team. Do we see the flow chart? All right, we're good. Cool. So a lot of times on these webinars, we spend time talking about specific topics or specific areas of focus, whether it's optimizing your registration or bidding on an opportunity at SAM.gov or GSA schedule. And while those are all very important uh, topics, they're also just pieces of the equation. What I really like about this flow chart and today's topic is this gives you a macro high level view of the entire federal contracting process, acquisition process, all the way from the decision to buy to contract closeout. And while it's not comprehensive in terms of covering every nuance and every substage that an agency may uh, go through or encounter, it gives you a great level set of the big picture and where you can position your firm or better understand how to position your firm to gain a competitive advantage. And so as we look at this flow chart, before I dive into the specific areas, I just want to point out, as you can see, it's got three color schemes, right? So we have this rose color on the left. We have this light blue color in the middle, and we have this green color on the right. So the rose color is acquisition planning. You can see that in the top right corner up here. Then you've got the middle section, which is contract formation. And then the green section is contract administration. So the first element of this that I want to point out, for most people that are introduced into the federal contracting market, you're taught by and large that the competitive process or the bid process or the acquisition process on your end starts at SAM.gov. And what I really like about this flowchart is you can see from a big step standpoint, there are one, two, three, four, five major steps that happen before a solicitation is posted at SAM.gov. And so number one, it gives you context, right? It gives you an understanding that SAM is a component piece. It's a part of the equation, but it's not the entire equation. It's not the beginning of the process. Moreover, and I think a more important point is, I think it's very important that everyone understand a big picture concept on this webinar, which is, that a federal buyer, be it a contracting officer or someone involved in acquisition, once they decide or once the rules dictate that something gets posted at the highlighted section, SAM.gov here in the middle, that triggers all these other light blue sections below SAM. So we have the respond component, the quotes, bids and offers component, the evaluate component, the competitive range, the approvals, and the responsibility assessment. And the reason why I bring that up is because each of these elements is extra paperwork, extra labor, extra engagement, more time before you can get to the, to the finished uh, contract. And so it's not really the path that everyone wants to take if they have options. 
It's more the path that ends up being where they go if they couldn't do other things, if they didn't have other acquisition methods. And so it's very important if you're a small business, it's very important for you to understand that SAM is not the primary way that a federal buyer necessarily wants to buy. And all of these sections that we're going to go through in a little bit more detail now give that federal buyer options. And what we like to call it with uh, federal acquisition, there's a rule book called the Federal Acquisition Regulation. And for any of you that don't know, I'm going to show you real quick. It's right here. It's this page, acquisition.gov. This is the rule book for government contracting. And so what we like to say is there are three R's to these rules, right? There's rules, risk, and resources. And the rules are how the government buyer deter excuse me, determines what path they're going to go down. So as an example, I'm going to increase the screen size here, and I'm going to scroll over a little bit. You see here right after the decision to procure, right? So right when the federal buyer is making a decision to make a purchase, one of the first considerations is this term micro-purchase. So if you've been on these webinars, you probably know by now, micro-purchase is a credit card purchase in most cases. It's called a procurement card or a P-card, micro-purchase. So the first decision that, that they can make is, is this transaction under $10,000 and is it something that is a defined commodity product or service? If so, they have the ability to buy it with a credit card and bypass all the rest of these stages. They don't have to do market research, they don't have to develop a procurement request, et cetera. It doesn't go through SAM. They just make the purchase and it goes right to award. So that's an example of how a government buyer early in the acquisition planning stage can make a determination that allows them to speed up the process and get to award faster. One of the challenges with micro-purchase as, a, as an option is, since there's no posting in SAM or any other public domain, micro purchases, credit card purchases, typically happen through relationship and awareness between the buyer and the potential seller. So you have to identify who the federal buyers are that buy this way and buy the products or services that you offer. So I just wanna take a moment and show everyone on the screen here. This is the GSA Smart Pay website. And at the top here is business lines. You can see here's a purchase card. So this is the card that they use to pay for supplies or services. There's other types of cards for travel, fleet, et cetera. But I want to focus on the purchase card. And just so you're aware in terms of the volume, in fiscal year 22, which is the last year they have all the data sort of reported, the federal government spent $32.8 billion on purchase cards. So that's all the, the cards combined, the purchase card, the fleet card, the um, travel card. But it's very important to understand, $32 billion is a significant spend uh, when it comes to contracting and acquisition. And if you're plugged in with those parties early in this process, when they're making this micro-purchase decision, you can get a credit card transaction that way. So going back to the rules, risk, and resources, let's say the rules say the dollar amount is over $10,000, so they cannot use a credit card. The next phase of the process is market research. Now, if you have been on these webinars from the very beginning, from the first one we did, you may recognize this chart, which is the, uh, the Candyland diagram of the market research process that an agency would go through. So when you look at this flow chart and you see this market research stage, understand that if you dive into this stage, it's actually a series of steps that that federal buyer is going through in order to determine a few things. Number one, what does the competition landscape look like, right? They're trying to figure out, can small businesses do this work? Can women-owned small businesses or service-disabled veteran-owned small businesses do this work? Are there enough of them willing to do the work that I can do what's called a set aside and reduce or restrict competition to only women owned, veteran owned, hub zone, et cetera, businesses? Um, are small businesses in general capable of doing the work? Is the work such that I can award a contract or a purchase order without having to go through the SAM.gov process? They're making all those determinations in each of these steps on the market research map they're gaining information
information and acquiring information from market research to inform them about whether or not they can skip any of the further stages and steps. So once the market research is conducted, that's going to give the procurement official, the acquisition official, sort of the lay of the land of what their options are. Now, for you as a small business owner, how do you see or how do you engage in market research? How do you participate in market research? Well, they don't call it market research surveys, but if you ever see a source of sought notice or a request for information on SAM.gov, those are examples of early stage market research data and information collection and interest gathering. Every federal agency also has a forecast of upcoming opportunities. That's early stage projection of market research. So if you're engaging in sources sought and requests for information, and you're engaging in the agency forecasting and reaching out on forecasted opportunities coming up in the future, then you're engaging during this market research acquisition planning stage, and it raises the odds and increases your odds of participating in opportunities and contracts not only before they make it to SAM, but more importantly, for those that never make it to SAM. So again, if you've been on these webinars, you've heard this theme, not everything gets posted at SAM.gov. So the last time we ran the data, if you can see here, only 36%, and that doesn't include the credit card transactions, we're talking about anything above the micro purchase threshold, only about 36% of the work gets posted at SAM.gov. And that's because some of the work, actually a lot of the work, doesn't meet the criteria to require a public posting. Either the transaction is, it's commercial, and the dollar threshold is such that there's not a whole lot of benefit to be gained by the government going through this whole process, because by and large, the product or service is a commodity, and the price point is not significant from the government's perspective. But from our perspective as small business owners, it can be very lucrative and it can the dollar amount can be very significant. So simplified acquisitions, which are more commonly known from the purchase method as purchase orders, can go up to $250,000. And in a lot of cases for those transactions, the contracting officer or the federal buyer has a lot of autonomy on how will they decide to buy or procure that product or service, meaning they do not necessarily have to post the opportunity at SAM.gov. So let me show you what that means in terms of the market. So if you can see my screen, I'm on USAspending.gov right now. And I ran a search for contract signed between 1-1 of 23 and 12-31 of obviously this year. So we're talking last calendar year and so far in January. I'm looking for only new awards and I'm looking for contracts competed under simplified acquisition or not competed under simplified acquisition. So the term that I just used, simplified acquisition, resulted in 724,992 transactions for a grand total of 19 and another two, so call it $21.5 billion. So these simplified transactions, in a lot of cases, never make it to SAM.gov. So let me show you some examples. I just pulled five of them from this list. You can see the purple links here. So these are the ones I pulled. So I wanna show you, this is a purchase order for enterprise as a service, service desk help endpoint management. This was for an amount of, let's see the outlaid amount on this. Oh, this is a blanket purchase agreement call. So this is where they said they did an individual call against a master contract. And I wanna show you down here, they did not have to post it at SAM. So it used to be called FedBizOps. Now it's SAM. There was no posting at SAM, and there was only one offer received through simplified acquisition. Here's another one. Simplified acquisition, two offers received. It was not applicable to be posted at SAM or FedBizOps. Here's another one. Not posted. Single offer, not competed under simplified acquisition. This was an 8A sole source. So on and on and on. The government uses the rules to determine at this market research stage whether or not they have the ability through the federal acquisition regulations, simplified acquisition rules, to bypass SAM and all of these subsequent stages on SAM. Now, 
I want to emphasize one more very important point that I think is going to help clarify some things for all of us that still do use SAM to respond to requests for quote or invitations for bid or requests for proposal. You may have recognized or you may have realized during your pursuit of work on SAM that you'd have, you might have a question about a particular contract or opportunity and you send an email out or you, you provide outreach to the point of contact listed on the opportunity because every SAM.gov notice has a contracting officer name, phone number, and email. So you can reach out to them based on the contact information provided. But if you're like most people that utilize SAM, you realize you don't get any responses. Or if you get a response, it's that it's already been addressed in a different platform or a different system, and it's not clear what your uh, response guidelines are from that individual because they're not having communication with you. The primary reason that happens is because once this stage is set, developing the procurement request, and I'm gonna drill in on this a little bit more. So basically what this means is, once the statement of work or the performance work statement or the statement of objectives has been ratified, right? Once that's been created, the federal buyers go into a, a method that my colleague William Randolph calls shields up. And what shields up means is, there is no in more informal one-on-one -on -one communication with an interested vendor. There is no more uh, direct collaboration about uh, how to solve the problem or what might be a reasonable price. And the reason for that is very simple, guys. It's because once this happens, it's now a formal solicitation or a formal opportunity, and the government opens itself up to protest. So if anybody is familiar with the award process of a federal contract and what happens when contracts get awarded, well, many solicitations from SAM have an average of about 17 uh, parties bidding on any one solicitation. So as you can imagine, this is a lot of time and money for both the prospect and for the government. And so when you get to the end and you have this award, you have one happy company and on average about 16 upset companies that look for any reason they can to protest this decision. So why does that matter? Because over here, once this, state, this stage is completed, if that contracting officer or anybody on the acquisition team had one-on-one -on -one communication with one of those 16 or the 17th, which was the winner, and did not have that communication with all of the other parties, that opens up that acquisition office to a protest and they have to recompete potentially this entire process. So if you're engaging at SAM during the solicitation stage, you are not going to have one-on-one -on -one communication with the federal acquisition office or decision makers. However, if you're able to engage during the early acquisition planning stages, you absolutely have the ability within reason to have informal communication and conversation about what's a reasonable price range, what the government's looking for, because there is no risk to protest up until the statement of work or performance work statement is completed. So that pretty much covers the acquisition planning stage. Before I move into the light blue section, that is procurement method and into SAM, Hugo, do we have any questions in the Q&A that you'd like me to address at this stage? Okay, so as I look at the Q&A, we have a hybrid question, but can't really understand it. Um, but as of right now, there are currently no questions on QA. Okay, I'm gonna keep going then. So now we're gonna move into this, um, this blue section, but I'm not gonna spend a lot of time on Sam. I'm gonna spend the majority of my time on this selecting the procurement method and what happens here, again, trying to bypass, if I'm the federal buyer, I'm trying to skip this entire section if I can. So what that means is I'm going to look for any method I can to reduce competition or reduce um, the administrative complexity of the process. One of the first things I'm going to look for, Everyone I would imagine has heard of indefinite delivery contracts, contracting vehicles, they might be called, um, indefinite delivery, indefinite quantity, IDIQ, IDV. All of these things are basically the same thing. 
What it means is the government's already got a pre-negotiated master contract, probably that was posted at SAM. The onboarding was probably posted at SAM. However, subsequent delivery orders or subsequent purchases that are placed against that master contracting vehicle are only offered to the companies that are on that contract. And it's a closed offer to only those that made it onto the contract, meaning there is no posting at SAM for that delivery order. The, the term they use is delivery order. So the delivery order is what gets placed against the master contract. And so one of the first things that a contracting officer is going to do is they're going to say, can I offer these services? I'm sorry, procure these services or products through an existing contracting vehicle before I go to the open market. A version of that contracting vehicle, that indefinite delivery contracting vehicle, is a GSA schedule. So a GSA schedule is a pre-negotiated contract with a five-year term, and it follows the same principles I just described, which means that the government can go on that GSA schedule, find that product or service, receive a quote from that vendor, and completely bypass the SAM.gov open market bid system. So those are examples of all the different ways in which a federal buyer can amplify and reduce friction and reduce the efficiency of purchasing without going to the open bid market. So now let's talk about we're at SAM and you find a solicitation or you find an opportunity at SAM. We have a lot of people that ask us when we do our consulting, can you help me write a proposal, respond to a quote request, et cetera, in SAM? So there's two answers to the question. There's a longer answer, but there's a shorter one that I want to cover on this webinar. Absolutely, we can help everybody with the decision to write a proposal, submit a quote, et cetera. The first step of offering support with proposal writing and quote request is to make sure you're in a good position to even offer that proposal solution or quote request. So what do I mean? What I mean is, in many cases, if your first exposure to an opportunity is when it gets posted at SAM.gov, you are at a significant disadvantage when it comes to who you're competing against. That coupled with, if you don't have past performance or past contracting history with the agency posting the notice, let's think about what you're up against. Number one, you're probably competing against companies that already have a track record with that agency. Number two, you're probably competing against companies that have known about the opportunity from the market research stage and have been planning to pursue it. And this is just another step on the journey for them, whereas you're coming in and this is your first step. So in both of those cases, you're at a significant disadvantage. A third factor that can put you at a disadvantage if you don't have contracting history is by the time it makes it to SAM, the risk profile of the opportunity has gone up. And if you don't have a track record of contracting history with the federal government, you are going to likely be seen if you don't have history with that agency, if you're not already known by the customer, and you don't have contracting history in general, you're going to be seen as a potentially high risk option as compared to the others that are responding. So our counsel to you when it comes to SAM.gov is as follows. All the sources sought and requests for information that even loosely match what you do, we would respond to those because they're an opportunity for you to get on the radar and start to build your awareness and brand with your customer. But if it's a formal solicitation, a request for quote, a request for proposal, an invitation for bid, unless you've got experience or you've been tracking that opportunity from the planning stage, you should seriously consider if the investment of time, money, and resources is worth it in terms of ROI and win potential. In most cases, you're going to find it's not. So what do we suggest you do if SAM.gov is not your best option? Our suggestion is simple. We want you to find the government buyers that buy the products and services you sell and engage them over here during acquisition planning. Put yourself in position when they're making the decision to procure or they're buying with a credit card or they're figuring out if they can make it a small business set aside or they, they'll have communication before the procurement request stage of statement of work or performance work statement. The earlier you can engage and influence, the better your odds 
of winning that work, especially the work that never makes it to Sam because it's a simplified acquisition. So before I move on from the blue section to the green section, Hugo, do we have any questions? Zach, believe it or not, we do. Um, I'd like okay. to thank uh, Bill, David, Linda, Teresa, and Rohan. Um, I hope I pronounced your names well. We'll start with Bill. So how do you connect with those Fed officials at the pre-SOW phase? What are the best forums slash channels? There's a number of ways to engage, but I'll give you a few, right? So the first that I would say is, number one, target the federal officials, the agencies, the sub-agencies, the offices that buy the products or services that you sell, that have a track record of buying from small businesses. And if you have the ability, find the ones that will buy from small businesses that don't have a, a federal contracting, significant federal contracting track record. If that's your profile, then there's federal buyers out there that match that profile. So first thing is targeting. Once you've targeted, I think it's more important how you engage in terms of what you bring to the table versus the platform. So let me explain what I mean. I just met with a client yesterday and that client is doing their own business development uh, outreach and they're doing it by email. And they're sending a lot of emails out and in this case, they're sending it to prime contractors and government buyers. And what I noticed about their email, their email was will, really well set up, really well structured, had all the right information in it. However, it was only about them and their business, meaning their NAICS codes, their GSA schedule. It was introducing their company to the recipient, but there was nothing in the email that spoke to that recipient that was personalized to them as to why they're receiving the email. In other words, you could take the email that I saw yesterday and you could send it to anybody because all it is is a resume. So the reason that doesn't work in most cases is because it doesn't resonate with the audience. You're not helping your audience by showing them that you understand their challenges or problems, that you have a solution that resonates with their needs, that you've done your research or homework. You're just basically blasting the same stuff out to everybody. So whether the channel is email, social media, a federal event, a face-to-face -face meeting, the intent and the process and the uh, what you should bring as far as input to the equation is specificity, research, and information that is personalized and relevant to your audience, to your customer, showing them that not only did you do your research, but you understand their problems, challenges, and goals, and your solutions help address those things. That would be my counsel about the best practice for reaching out during the early stages of acquisition planning. Okay, perfect. Uh, you ready for the next question, Zach? I am. This comes from David. Do companies outsource a sales agency to help get business within the GSA? Currently, our sales reps in-house don't have experience with this, so trying to find out how to grow in this space. We are GSA submitted, waiting on approval as of now. We already are on SAM. Yes, I would say, I'm going to go a little broader on that, and I would say that the GSA schedule is a method of acquisition. It's a method of purchase. And understand the buyers use multiple tools, right? So, and I'll address the, the first part of that question here in a minute, but I want to give you a, a, a wider perspective. Someone that buys through GSA also buys using a purchase order, not through GSA, also buys with a credit card, also buys through other indefinite delivery contracts, also post jobs and opportunities at SAM, also does sources sought and requests for information, also collaborates with their small business specialist to find resources. So my point is, don't just sit around and wait for the GSA to get processed and then try to figure out how to monetize it. Your target audience is your target audience. GSA is a method, it's a way they buy, but that does not define your audience. Your audience is defined by who buys the products or services that you sell, and then what are their acquisition methods, right? Do the research into that. Now, the question about hiring a sales team or subcontracting, subletting the GSA, I know there are companies that work together in a teaming capacity where one company has a GSA schedule and other companies may utilize their GSA schedule to sell their products and services. I'm not sure if that's your question, if I'm answering it uh, the way that you're asking, but the general counsel I would give you is start doing your market research and find your buyers now, especially because if your GSA schedule is in process, once that gets awarded, it's going to be congratulations and the clock is ticking. 
you have to generate a certain level of sales on your GSA schedule in order to retain it. So building the relationships, identifying your customers, and making that communication inroads while your GSA schedule is processing is your best bet to monetize your GSA schedule once it goes through the process and gets approved. Thank you for that answer, Zach. You ready for the next? I am. This comes from Linda. My question is as follows. What platform, again, are we able to submit RFQs to pursue opportunities for sole soul projects? I understand the GSA platform. Once qualified as an option, what are other platforms? P.S. I apologize for my late arrival. <laughs> I was sitting for 12 minutes on an incorrect training, which is scheduled for June 18th. So, uh, Linda, that's completely okay. We appreciate you, and thanks for the question. <laughs> But Zach, uh, I'll let you answer it. So I think the core around that question is sole source. How do I get positioned for a sole source contract? Whether that sole source contract is through GSA or through a set aside or any means. And guys, it's <clears throat> it's the same answer. And I hate to, I don't want to be a broken record, but I, I want you to understand that a lot of the outcomes that you're asking come from the inputs that we're talking about. So let me give you a scenario. I'll give you an example. If you offer a unique product or service, number one, uh, or a unique way to solve a problem if it's service-based. And you identify the customer that has that challenge, right? The challenge that aligns with the, the product or service that you offer. So let's start there. Let me back up. You should make sure that there's actual federal demand for the product or service that you offer, right? You should make sure that it's what the government buys. And if there's not demand for what you offer, you need to put yourself in a position to offer a product or service that's in demand because you can't make the government buy something they don't want to buy there's no rule that's going to make that happen. So first, assess demand. Second, once demand is assessed, find out who the customers are that have that demand and what it is that motivates them from a solutioning standpoint that allows you to be the right solution for that customer. Once you identify the demand, the challenge, and how you can help solve it, the idea is, the mindset is, you've got to brand yourself with that audience. There's a difference between branding and marketing. Branding will lead to sole source opportunities that aren't even really sole source contracts. You may be the only one that receives a quote request from that government buyer because you're the right solution at the right time. And they sent a solicit, I'm sorry, they sent a request out for quote to three vendors and you're the only one that responded. So you just got that contract as the only quote request response. That's technically a sole source contract but it wasn't set aside for you. It was open to the market, but you're the only one that responded. So how do you make that happen? Well, the way you make that happen is you have to brand yourself and be top of mind when that buying decision happens. So an analogy that I'll use is, we've all been to some big box store, right? And we're going to the store for a certain reason. And you got that guy in the middle of the store that's yelling at you to change your cell phone plan or trying to sell you a cable subscription. And if you're like me, I just avoid that guy altogether. I'm not there to buy what he's selling and I don't need somebody marketing to me. So you don't want to constantly be marketing to somebody your services without it resonating with their needs. That's why I said earlier, you want to come to the table, understanding their needs, responding to a forecast, responding to an RFI or sources sought. Then instead of it being like the guy yelling at you to change your plan, for that buyer, it's gonna be more like the coupon you get on your cell phone for the thing that you already buy anyway, and you feel great because that coupon resonates with you because it's something you already buy. If you're staying in front of your customer in that way, where you're saying, hey, here's an RFI, I'm responding to it, I wanna remind you who I am. Hey, here's a forecasted opportunity that's in line with what we do, I wanna remind you who I am. Hey, here's an awarded contract that recently was awarded that was not posted in SAM. These are exactly the types of services we offer. I want to remind you I'm available to you. If you do that earnestly, consistently, and over time, you're going to position yourself to get one of those quote unquote sole source contracts. Are we still on cue for more questions, Zach, or do you want to pivot back? I can, I can do one more. Okay, let's take uh, Teresa. Uh, at which stage does sole sourcing come into play? Early as possible. The probably at the decision to procure. So here, let me, I'm going to share my screen again real quick and I'll walk you through sole source. Right here, when someone decides they're going to buy something, 
and they can go buy it with a credit card. They don't have to compete it. They don't have to announce it. They don't have to get three quotes. They can just buy it from wherever they want. So there's your first sole source opportunity right there. You're in the right position. They're buying with a credit card. They buy from you. That's quote unquote a sole source contract. Next stage, market research. Contracting officer posts the sources sought notice. Guess what we've learned from contracting officers over time, folks? Nobody responds to the sources sought notices to the degree or the level that they need them to in order to be able to set more contracts aside for small business. Businesses spend way too much time going after proposals and quotes they can't win and too little time demonstrating their ability and availability during the sources sought stage. So since so many people don't respond to sources sought notices, sources sought notices and requests for information can lead directly to sole source contracts. When the statement of work or the performance work statement is being created, I had a client who sells laser training devices to Customs and Border Protection. They found him on uh, one of these reality top shot shows. The program manager liked what he saw in terms of this training device and ordered directly from him a purchase order for these training devices. Fast forward two years, they do a large contract with all of DHS. This gentleman helps write the statement of work and nobody else can match the specs within the time frame that's expected. So that's an example of at this stage where you can create a source of sought, or excuse me, a sole source contract. Then depending on if you have the contracting vehicle or the easy way to buy, they'll skip Sam by going to the contracting vehicle and possibly awarding you a sole source contract. So the answer is everywhere on this journey, there's an opportunity to get a sole source. Where it doesn't happen is once it gets here. Once it gets here, they've got to go through all of the competition. They've got to give everybody a fair chance. They've got to give everybody equal treatment. Prior to this, the earlier you're plugged in and the better your solution solves their problem, the higher your likelihood to get a sole source contract. Perfect. Do you want me to, to give you one more or do we want to transition back to the presentation? Yeah, I'll transition back. I'll wrap up this contract closeout section. I think this is very important. And then uh, we can do the last five minutes. We can do Q&A. And I'm actually super excited. There's seven questions that popped in the radar. So okay. very grateful. And we'll continue. And we'll, we'll make sure we answer those. So, Zach. Yep. Yeah. And we'll go through this pretty quick, guys. So there's two points I want to make about the green section and contract closeout. Number one, am I telling you not to ever uh, fill out a RFP or submit an RFQ, submit a quote or submit a proposal? I am not. In fact, <clears throat> there's a strategy you can employ where – you anticipate you're not going to win the contract. However, the customer is someone you want to meet. So you submit your quote or your proposal so that when the contract's awarded, likely not to you, you can have what's called a debriefing. And a debriefing is where you're able to meet with that customer post-award to understand exactly why you were not awarded the contract, where your deficiencies were. The reason that's so important is because a lot of folks use the debriefing as a way to complain and or set up a protest. If you come to the debriefing as a small business and you earnestly come with the mindset of, I wanna learn how to improve and how to work better with your agency, not only are you meeting the customer, you're also demonstrating you're someone they probably wanna work with. So that's a way to leverage the debrief. Second thing I want you to understand is just because that contract got awarded does not mean it's over. Most federal contracts have a term between one and five years and 70% of the work that gets contracted has an ultimate expiration date and is going to be recompeted for almost exactly the same product or service in the near future. So one of your strategies to try to get in front of SAM is to look for expiring contracts with expiration dates coming up in the next 6 to 12 months and start building the relationship with that buyer, knowing that a new contract is going to be coming out to replace the one that's expiring. So I'll stop there, and we can do whatever Q&A is left, Hugo. Sounds good. Um, okay, so Rohan is asking, can you just provide an exhaustive list of ways of procuring these contracts apart from Sam? Absolutely, become a customer. <laughs> that was a uh, hold on. <laughs> answering <laughs> live. It's just, it's just too hard. That's, that's too hard a question to answer in the broad, in the abstract, and I'll give you a reason why. Some of you guys sell parts and uh, products, and you should be working with Defense Logistics Agency. And some of you sell services and you should be working with Army Corps of Engineers. And some of you sell PPE and you should be working with the VA. 
So without knowing more about your business, it doesn't do a lot of good to give you every exhaustive way to sell to the government because 80% of them don't apply to you. And there's also a great quote that we would use in the entrepreneurship world, which is our overnight success took 20 to 30 years. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we, we plan on collapsing time for you, but it is a deliberate effort. And, then, and guys, the one word I'm going to use is focus. Like there, don't try to understand everything about the federal market. You're never going to get there. Understand only exactly what you need to move forward. Awesome. And then uh, we'll transition to a question from Linda. Okay. Can you recite the simplified acquisition caps for VA, DOD, and DHS? They're not really, they don't change much in terms of agency, but they do change based on things like emergency. So here, I've got the simplified acquisition procedure up here. I'm going to tell you that it doesn't mean that it doesn't have to be posted at SAM, but they can use simplified acquisition right here, depending on certain conditions, up to seven and a half million, 15 million for construction. So that's really uh, an anomaly, but the the bright line, the sort of the easy number to sort of remember is 250,000. Anything under 250,000, every agency has the uh, ability to utilize simplified acquisition procedures in some context. And in many cases, that means uh, lack of requirement to post the contract at SAM.gov, lack of a requirement to go through the traditional acquisition process, and able to have direct quote requests and awards with small businesses based on uh, limited visibility and competition. So it made, for example, with COVID, every agency had a mandate during COVID to increase both the micro purchase threshold and the simplified acquisition threshold. I can get deeper into it agency by agency, but the number you should have in your mind is 250,000 or below. I think for most small businesses, I know I'd be happy with a $250,000 transaction. Okay, perfect. Uh, do I have your permission to continue, Zach? Sure. Okay, so Aziz has, uh, well, I commend Aziz for his diligent effort. I'm trying to get a, a question out. So yep. uh, it's on the radar. Uh, so he's stating back to market research. What are the sources, yep. websites to know about agencies' market research? I only know what government agencies post on SAM. Is there any other source I can check? That's a great question. Yes. Every federal, let me back up, not every federal agency. Many federal agencies have their own internal websites that they utilize for market, exactly for what you're talking about, internal market research. I'll give you an example. The VA is a really big one. There's a, uh, if you Google this, it's VA Pathfinder, P-A-T-H-F-I-N-D-E-R. That is an internal database the VA uses to uh, vet and store vendor profiles, probably capability statements. And so every agency has, has uh, again, I'm, I'm sorry, not every, most agencies have a similar methodology or structure internally for managing uh, small business profiles. And in a lot of cases, you can engage a small business specialist for that particular agency to gain insights into that. Um, my suggestion is going to be, it's going to be the same thing I've said over and over. Target three to five agencies and instead of registering in every agency's one way, pick three to five agencies and figure out 10 to 12 different engagement strategies for those three to five agencies, if not fewer, if not one to three. Multifaceted, intentional, deliberate communication with targeted agencies versus spreading yourself and trying to become all things to all every, every agency is the strategy we would employ. We'd say go narrow and deep, not shallow and wide. Okay, great answer. Uh, we'll segue to another question. And I apologize. There is no way I'm going to be able to, uh, to state this name, but I'll give you credit. Uh, how do I obtain a card to get started on micro purchases? And is there a requirement to obtain this? So you, you don't have to acquire the card. You have to have the ability to accept credit cards, right? So um, a lot of folks don't realize that technology over the last five to 10 years has made the opportunity or the ability for a business to accept credit cards a lot easier, a lot less friction. Uh, but you have to be able to accept credit cards. The credit card is actually coming from the government, right? So the government buyer has a purchase card. And when they need your product or service, they would reach out to you and they would give you the credit card number or you would swipe the credit card and transact the business. So you need to be able to accept credit cards. You don't get a card. 
Okay, so I'll segue into the next question uh, by uh, Lara. What are the best methods for doing market research? You mentioned targeting agencies that buy what we sell. Are there best websites to utilize? The best, in my experience, has always been a combination of uh, analyzing the budget for each agency, right? Every agency has to submit an annual budget every year. And so they list their priorities in a macro sense in the budgets. But really where the truth comes out, and this comes back to my co uh, collaboration with William Randolph as a former contracting officer, all of the, the pre-award data is storytelling, right? They're telling stories about what they want to buy or how they want to buy, and it's got angles and perspectives. Where the truth comes out is in the reporting data, contract award data, accounting data. It's in usaspending.gov, sam.gov, FPDS, which is Federal Procurement Data System. That's where we live. So I'm a 15-year data analyst. I live in the, the award data because that's nothing but truth, right? Everything has to be accounted for categorized, and it allows you to my, uh, manage and model that data to identify over a defined period of time who are your target customers. So I would say, say uh, usaspending.gov, sam.gov, and federal procurement data system, analyzing and then contextualizing that data is at least how we help our clients determine who to focus on. That's part of our process, and it's the only way I would do it because it's the only way I feel gives you 100% of the story. Great answer, Zach. Uh, we have one on the radar from James. What vehicle does the Gov use to put out a RFI? Uh, Sam.gov. So they don't call it an RFI. The RFIs are posted under sources sought. But if you go to Sam.gov and you look under, there, there's two categories to look under. Sources sought is going to give you sources sought and RFIs. By the way, RFI stands for Request for Information. So really... The big difference, it's all interpretative, but the big difference is a source is sought is typically utilized when the government knows what it's trying to acquire and it's trying to specifically figure out if there are small businesses and then classes of small businesses that can do the work. A request for information is typically utilized when the government's not quite sure what its available solutions are in the marketplace and is looking for industry feedback about how to best solve a problem but both are listed under sources sought. And then the other section in SAM.gov that sometimes contains RFIs and sources sought is the section called special notice. Special notice is kind of a grab bag, all kinds of stuff in there. But within the things that are in special notice, you'll find requests for information, sources sought, and also industry day uh, notifications. So I would say those are the two places within SAM.gov to look for RFIs, requests for information. Okay, beautiful. There's a... Uh... Actually, one question that kind of uh, uh, circles back to the merchant processing. We have uh, a lady that's asking, do I need to get a merchant services with my bank to accept credit card purchases? So I might be able to segue into that for you, Zach. Yep. When it comes to credit card processing, you have a couple variables to consider. The first variable is your uh, price point of your average uh, credit card charge that you're going to take, because that could either be high ticket or low ticket. So anything above $500 in the industry, it's considered high ticket. So therefore, you're going to be put into a high risk category, right? I'm making the assumption that a significant amount of you are would like to take credit card purchases higher than $500. Well, and if that's the case, you're going to be in that particular category if you've never taken credit cards before with your with your business in general. So that's the first variable to consider. The second variable is you have something called face-to-face -face transactions and non-face-to-face -face transactions. So a face-to-face -face transaction is if the customer is going to actually show up to your business or show up to you and you're actually going to take the card and swipe it. That is called a face-to-face -face transaction. On the other, you have key transactions. And a key transaction is something as simple as the government sending over a, an, in, an invoice or you're, or you're sending it over an invoice to the government. The government then you know, uh, uh, pays for it online. And if they do so, that's considered a non-face-to-face -face transaction. So with those three variables in mind, my recommendation always is to work 
with your local bank, especially if it's a credit union, that you have an established relationship to set up your first merchant account. And this is why you want to set up at least three, right? You want one with your banking institution that you already have a relationship with, right? Because they're ready to see capital flowing in and out. You might already be in business with them for two to three years. So it's a lot easier for them to get through the risk tolerance of accepting you as a merchant uh, merchant processor. The other is I recommend that you look up, look online and try to identify to see if you can find a merchant account processor. That's usually an ISO. They're called independent sales organizations. And one of them that I highly recommend is uh, First Data. The other that I recommend is uh, Encompass is phenomenal. Uh, we've been working with them for a while and there's some others. So you have uh, and then from there, I recommend you try to find another one so you have three. And the reason why you want three is because what could happen is imagine if you take a credit card from, uh, let's say in one month, you take 10 credit card uh, transactions and each one, was, let's say it's $1,000, right? At the end of the month, that's 10,000, right? Now imagine that out of those 10, two of them were non-government related, right? And let's pretend two of them were just from your average, you know, mom and pop that actually took the transaction. And let's pretend that you had two chargebacks, right? If they give you two chargebacks, that processor that you're working with could just freeze your account. Because now they want you to be able to explain why there's charge chargebacks because you might not be meeting their risk management requirement. Now, what, what happens now? Now, you are you don't have a way to be able to accept more capital, right? So what you want to do is have a backup plan and always have a plan B, plan C. That's always my recommendation. And then the other, why it's very important to be able to develop a relationship with, let's say, a bank or a credit union is because over time, once you're taking a, a, an average amount of credit card processing monthly, they'll look at your average. And then at any time when you need a short-term loan, you can go to that bank and they'll give it to you. It's usually a one-to-one -one ratio, right? So if you're doing like $50,000 in credit card processing, and let's say you need a short-term solution to help uh, alleviate a short-term problem in small business, you can go to the bank to look at your credit card processing, and then you'll be able to get funding, you know, same day. So there are a lot of variables you want to consider. You know, those are some of the cliff notes that I would recommend, but I highly recommend you set up at least three accounts just to have a plan A, plan B, plan C. So uh, with that in mind, I'll transition to another question. Uh, do you have anything for that, Zach? Since I took that no, I, I think you covered it well. The only, my only dovetail is not only will you not be able to accept new transactions if that happens, they also may freeze the funds that are currently in the account uh, and put under review. So it's sort of a double whammy. So to Hugo's point, three, back, three accounts, two backups is the way to stay capitalized. Okay, so we have a one from Kim, and I'm uh, – uh, you might be able to answer this, Zach. Uh, the question okay. is, is that – 250,000 per year of for five years? No, no, that's $250,000 per transaction. So the simplified acquisition threshold is $250,000 per transaction. And the credit card line, because I don't think we talked about that, the micro purchase threshold, the credit card limit is $10,000. So a government buyer can swipe a card with you for $9,995 today and then come back and swipe that card with you for $9,995 tomorrow. And if they issue a purchase order for $249,000 today, they can issue another one to you for $249,000 tomorrow. It's per transaction. Okay, awesome. And then we have uh, no. Uh, okay, question from Samuel. Where do you find pending projects for specific government agencies? which you can use to match your services and uncover a problem you can solve as a vendor? Most, the be the easiest or best answer is forecast, right? Forecast of opportunities. I would also say 
annual and quarterly industry days that have presentations where the agency is basically announcing to the contracting community what their priorities are, what their onboarding strategies are, what their acquisition strategies are. Um, and then just basically staying engaged with the small business specialist with that particular agency because they're going to have access to internal resources and um, information that is not necessarily always part of the public domain. So I would say forecasts, agency forecasts, events, especially annual and quarterly events with PowerPoint presentations and small business specialist engagement. Okay, perfect. Then what we'll do is we'll take – well, there's what well, let's say we'll take two to three more questions. One of them has to deal with the DHL event. Will we will we get the email to sign up for the DHL event happening later this month? You talked about oh that. the DHS event, yeah. Um, yeah, it's on the twenty fifth. I'll make sure in the email that goes out after this <clears throat> webinar that we uh, spotlight that information, and we'll make sure that that goes in the uh, email that goes out um, today or tomorrow. Post this webinar. We'll we'll add the DHS link and information to that one as well. Okay, perfect. Um, how do you find it? Okay, so we have two by the same gentleman. Uh, how do you find the opportunities for sole source contract? And is there any competition among new companies for a specific demand? All right, so I, I've already answered the sole source contract a couple of times, guys. There's no other, there's no secret path here. Other than, let me, let me back up, I'll, I'll be fair. If you want, you know, if you can get an 8A certification, if you qualify for 8A, and we know that's a whole lot different now because of the discriminatory rules that you have to meet, and um, you, you don't just qualify based on being a disadvantaged member anymore. You have to be able to prove discrimination. But point being, the bar to get an 8A certification has just gotten higher, which means there's going to be fewer qualified 8A firms to meet the sole source demand of the 8A market. So if you qualify or can qualify through the SBA for an 8A certification, that is your most direct path to sole source contracts. There's also sole source contracts for woman-owned, veteran-owned, service-disabled, veteran-owned, and hub zone companies. Um, beyond that, if you don't have one of those certifications or designations, it's what we've already talked about. It's identifying the target audience, engaging them early, and going after opportunities below $250,000 that don't require them to post for, for uh, public competition. That's, that's the math. Okay, perfect. And then uh, we have one from uh, uh, L'Oreal, and I, it has to do with renewable energy. So are you familiar with the renewable energy market with the Fed government? I need help obtaining contracts in that industry. Yeah, we've had, this seems to be a recurring theme on our webinars. We have something around either electric vehicles, batteries, renewable energy. The short answer is, with the uh, infrastructure bill that was recently uh, funded within the last 12 to 8 to 12 months, there is a significant carve out for renewable energy and alternative energy. Um, and, and the answer is yes, we have the ability with the data and the information and the resources that we have to assist you in identifying, targeting, engaging, and possibly acquiring a piece of the renewable energy market specifically as it pertains to the demand that's coming from the infrastructure bill. Okay, perfect. So we'll take two questions. These are the last two. So one is from Rohan that says, can you please repeat the ISOs you recommend, Hugo? Uh, first disclosure is that we are not attorneys or financial advisors and don't play, uh, no play them on TV nor the internet. But what we'll do is when we get done with this uh, webinar, uh, we'll send out an email and I'll make sure, Rohan, that you personally get uh, on the email. We'll put a list of just recommended and we'll give several. Uh, but I just want to make sure we check with our compliance team on how to uh, formulate and navigate that communication. But uh, you have our word that we will send you that list when we get ready to, to uh, send out the email with the assets. Uh, on the other, the last is from Bill Vaughn. What is the process for women-owned small biz certification? I try to find it on certified.sba.gov and ended up accidentally starting an AA application. I just haven't found the correct entry point. Uh, yeah, we can follow up with you directly, Bill, to get you that. The bottom line is it is it's certified at sba.gov. They handle all the certifications now, even veteran-owned. 
But in terms of woman owned, there's a subsection on the site to do that. And um, if you put your email address either in the Q and A or uh, I can, I'll tell everybody mine Zach at federalcontractingadvisors.com. Uh, send me a direct email and I'll go get the woman owned link and send it to you directly so that you're on the right path. Okay, perfect. So uh, with that being said, we took all of our questions. Do you have anything in closing on your side, Zach? No, other than uh, it's the new year. I wanted to give everyone a new perspective on federal marketing and the federal market and uh, engage early and target effectively. And I think you're going to have some success in 2024. So that's our, that's our intent is to make sure everybody's off on the right foot. Awesome. And don't forget everyone on, uh, for those that missed any of our other webinars, uh, on our YouTube channel, which you can find uh, by going to YouTube and looking up Federal Contracting Advisors. Or if you're on our website, you can go to videos and it'll take you directly to the YouTube channel. While you're there, we have a section which is titled Federal Foundation Insights Weekly Mastermind Webinar Series. When you click on that, it'll take you to the playlist of all our webinars that we're uploading and recorded. Uh, the one that we're performing right now is actually our 100, 113. It's our 13th. We just started with one in the front. Uh, so at any time, if you feel that you want to catch up on your education, you can. And then uh, on uh, the, yeah, so I highly recommend you check out the playlist and the videos. But as we bring our session to a close, I want to extend a heartfelt thank you to Zach Larson for his invaluable insights and expertise. I also want to thank each and every one of you for your active participation and of course, engagement, especially in the Q&A. Today's webinar on the generic basic federal acquisition flowchart has shed light on a critical aspect of the federal contracting world. And we hope it has provided you with the tools and understanding to navigate this area more effectively. At Federal Contracting Advisors, we are committed to your success in the federal contracting arena. The feedback and enthusiasm we've received for these webinars are truly heartening, and they inspire us to keep bringing valuable content your way. For those of you seeking personalized guidance or looking to dive deeper into the world of federal contracting, our doors are always open. We invite you to book a discovery call with our team of federal market strategists. Let us help you tailor your strategies to align with your unique business objectives. I've added a booking link on the chat for anyone that wants to book. We'll be following up with an email containing the key takeaways from today's webinar, including that ISO question for merchant services, along with the additional resources to support your journey in federal contracting. Thank you once again for joining us. Your, participa your participation makes these webinars a success, and we look forward to continuing this journey with you helping each one of you achieve unparalleled success in federal contracting. Have a great week, guys, and we'll see you next week.